this project has been funded through an insight grant from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada. Today I'm going to talk about three different approaches to analyzing Hildegard's music using various computer aids and undertaken by uh, our, my research team. The first is a comparison of differentiae, the second uh, approach searching for contrafacts or quotations, and the third identifying Hildegard specific riffs. All three approaches are using the melodies as they appear in the two main Hildegard sources, the Reason Codex and the Dendermonde manuscript, which was completed at Rupertsberg and sent in the 1170s before Hildegard died to the monks at the Cistercian Abbey of Villers. The differentiate comparison was uh, begun with the assistance of Rebecca Shaw. Rebecca built this differentia database. Um, she is now a music archivist at the University of Toronto Libraries, uh, but she completed an MA thesis as well as a music uh, master's in uh, library and information sciences, um, both at Dalhousie University. She was working as a research assistant on a a standardization project to standardize the differentia field in the Cantus database. Um, the results of that research have not yet been imported into the Cantus database, but we do have this uh, specialized differentia database where we can uh, search the differentia field across manuscripts. The uh, it includes 161 manuscripts, the differentia from 161 manuscripts, and um, these can be searched in various ways, as you would expect, uh, through the siglum, provenance, century, uh, monastic order, notation style. The index of the differentiae can also be searched um, in various ways through ID, through a melodic transcription, century, mode, all of those sorts of things. Um, and we can see that there are 1,273 unique differentiae included in the database. There are many, many instances of each of those uh, in various manuscripts, but there are 1,273 unique differentiae. Um, this is, page is sorting them by uh, popularity, and we can see that differentia 129a in mode 5 appears in 143 manuscripts. So I used um, this differentia database to search for all of the differentiae found in Dendermonde and the Reason Codex and found some very interesting results, which I'll show you by walking you through mode by mode. Now, differentiae usage is inconsistent in these manuscripts. Not every antiphon has one, and as you can already see on the screen, there are no mode 3, 5, or 7 differentiae in either Dendermonde or the Reason Codex. And in fact, there are no modes 5 or 7 antiphons in those two manuscripts either. We're going to begin with mode 1. There are 12 mode 1 antiphons, and across these 12 uh, antiphons, three differentiae are used. Um, the first two are uh, found in uh, quite a few manuscripts, 67a in 34 manuscripts, and 66r in 46 manuscripts. Um, if we assess the other manuscripts that use these two differentiae by type of institution, uh, we get this interesting result, which is that they are found not only in Dendermonde and Reason Codex, but um, in other Benedictine uh, monasteries, in Augustinian monasteries, and in cathedrals. Now the database itself uh, covers a number of other kinds of monastic um, institutions, um, but they're only found in Benedictine and Augustinian monasteries and in cathedrals. It's a little surprising that uh, there are no Cistercian manuscripts found in this grouping. In fact, none of the differentiae used in Dendermonde and the Reason Codex are also found in, in any of these seven Cistercian manuscripts. And this is interesting because um, we, as I said, we know that the Dendermonde manuscript was sent to the monks at Villers. Um, Villers, they 
uh, were a Cistercian Abbey, and the placement of the differentiae in Dendermonde is rather odd, uh, and which has made some people think that maybe they were added at Villers um, and not at Rupertsberg, um, which if it was the case, then we would expect the differentiae to correspond with the other Cistercian manuscripts, not with the Benedictine, um, along with the Augustinian and the, and the cathedral manuscripts. So it's possible that we already know from this data that um, the differentiae were added at Rupertsberg. Um, now, what do I mean by odd? So if we take a look at folio 155R, um, we have this antiphon cum erebu errant, um, which ends on the final E, which would uh, is a final associated with modes 3 or 4. The differentia, which follows immediately, however, is a mode 1 differentia and a common mode 1 differentia. The chant that follows O Frondens Virga, if we look at the bottom, the little green circle, we can see that it ends on D, which is the final for modes 1 or 2, which corresponds with that differentia that occurs before the antiphon rather than after it. Um, the cum erebuerent differentia actually is up here in the margin, and um, it is a, a common mode for differentia, which again corresponds with that E final at the end of cum erebuerent. Now this is just one folio, and these things do happen in other manuscripts occasionally, but the whole manuscript is riddled with this kind of problem. Having differentiate in the margin certainly suggests that they were added as an afterthought, but there is space left between many of the antiphons, as we can see just after cum erobuerent, so it's really not clear what happened. Were they added at Rupertsberg or at Villers? On the basis of the differentiae, I would say not at Villers. There's not a single differentia in either of these two manuscripts that also appears in one of the seven Cistercian manuscripts in the differentia database. Mostly they are in Benedictine or cathedral manuscripts, or in some cases Augustinian. Going back to differentiae 67a and 66r, we can also look at the geographic locations of the manuscripts that use the same differentiae, and what we see are that they are almost all southern Germanic, found in German, Austrian, Czech, and Swiss locations, as well as the Low Countries, um, mostly Utrecht in this case. And notably, they are not found in French, Italian, Spanish, or English manuscripts. Rupertsberg is, of course, also in a southern German location, so the differentiae usage very much confirms the South German context. The final mode 1 differentia is found in only four manuscripts and follows the same pattern of Benedictine and cathedral usage. And we see Munster, uh, which is getting closer to North German, um, and another Low Country uh, connection with Zutphen. Moving on to mode 2, for which Hildegard has only four antiphons, we find just two differentiae in the Hildegard manuscripts, one which appears in four South German Benedictine or cathedral locations, and the other that appears only in Dendermunde. Hildegard has two antiphons that I've identified as mode 3, neither with differentiae, and 22 mode 4 antiphons, 16 of which include differentiae in at least one of the manuscripts. Amongst these, seven differentiae are included, five of which appear in only a single manuscript, either Dendermonde or the Reason Codex. Differentia 47a appears in eight manuscripts, and 41d in 9. If we look at these seven, however, we can see that they are all variations of each other, with the differences mostly just pitch repetitions and the use of liquescence. If we look at the monastic usage for the two uh, popular differentiae here, 47a and 41d, we again see Benedictine usage in southern German locations, while the cathedral usage 
Again, it shows southern Germanic locations as well as the Low Countries. Only a single mode 6 differentia appears in these two Hildegard manuscripts, and it is for a transposed mode 6 antiphon. There are three other antiphons amongst the two manuscripts that also appear to be transposed mode 6, but they do not have differentiae with them. Mode 6 is unusual in that most mode 6 chants across the repertory use just a single differentia. Uh, the one at the top here, 7a, found in 131 manuscripts, that's out of 161, and its transposed version, uh, T7aA, found in 71 manuscripts. Um, there's a big drop to the third most popular from 71 to 14, and then down to 13. The top eight um, mode 6 differentia differentiate in the database are in fact again if we look at them all variations of one another. The one that appears in Dendermonde is the fourth most popular version found in 13 manuscripts and if we look at the manuscripts uh, where this variation is found we see a couple of Augustinian monasteries um, unusually one in England and one in France some South German cathedrals and some cathedrals in the Low Countries and in northern France and then a lone English cathedral at the bottom. Finally there is only one mode 8 antiphon in the two Hildegard manuscripts and in Dendermonde it includes, includes a transposed differentia. Now that transposed differentia T123F if we look at the untransposed version, so 123F, um, it is found in only four manuscripts and they're all Southern German or one of them is in Utrecht. Despite the unusual manuscript treatment of the differentiae in the Hildegard manuscripts, being able to compare differentiae usage across 161 manuscripts does locate these manuscripts in mostly Benedictine and cathedral traditions in southern German locations as well as in the Low Countries. Given that there are no surviving liturgical sources from Rupertsberg, these findings are significant for our understanding of liturgical practice there. The second approach that we've been using is uh, to search for contrafacts or quotations. And uh, for this work, um, Ilaria Kulshaw and Lucia Dank are both research, were both working for me as research assistants and carried out um, quite a bit of this research. As we're all aware, single chants are often reused for multiple offices um, with the same text and music. The chants have the same text and music, but they're shared amongst offices. So we have uh, Haec est Regina Virginum, which is used for the Nativity of Mary, the Conception of Mary, the Assumption of Mary, the Annunciation, and also for Mary of the Snows. Similarly, medieval plain chant composers often reused melodies with new texts with the new chant known as a contrafact. As we've known for a long time, Hildegard of Bingen uh, reused her Kyrie um, for her responsory, O Lucidissima, or vice versa. In 1998, Margot Fassler demonstrated uh, Hildegard's reuse of an antiphon that was not her own, but was rather very common in the chant repertory, the Marian antiphon Ave Regina Celorum, for Hildegard, which Hildegard reworked for her responsory, O Nobilissima. Since there are now tens of thousands of searchable melodies in the Cantus database, I thought it would be interesting to try to find further contrafacts by searching methodically. My research assistants, Ilaria Kulshaw and Lucia Dank, created Excel files for every chant and then used the melody search tool in the Cantus database uh, to search the beginnings of all of Hildegard's melodies in the database to try to find exact matches. We found Hildegard quoting herself in these two antiphons and also sharing melodies between one of the entries in the Order Fortutum and her antiphon Quia Ergo 
femina, we can see the opening of the chant, the phrase continuing, the ending is um, different in the last part of the phrase, uh, except the very, they both end on E approached um, from D below. Hildegard also quotes other chants from the broader repertory. Here it looks like one of the entries in the Ordo Virtutum is quoting the opening of the Te Deum. And we have a longer example of an entry in the Ordo Virtutum quoting a Marian antiphon, Gratulare, Gratulare et Letare. And we can see the phrase aligning there. The next two slides show an even longer quotation with the Hildegard antiphon O quam mirabilis est fashioning itself on the Marian responsory Gloriosa dicta constant and we can see that opening gesture repeating it continues in Gloriosa um, and as the phrase continues uh, we get the matching melodies. Hildegard inserts an extra bit up to the octave and then um, it matches again at the end. Uh, Lucia explored these quotations as well as others in her MA thesis, which she just finished a month ago at Dalhousie. And her thesis is actually available online on the Dalhousie website. Um, if you Google it, you will find it. What these quotations tell us is just how immersed Hildegard's compositional practice was in the general repertory. The third approach is trying to find Hildegard specific riffs and for this uh, part of the project I've been working with Kate Helson, Mark Daly and Jake Schindler and Lucia Dank helped with one of the earlier parts of the process. While well, the other two approaches, comparing differentiae and searching for matching melodies, used online databases and the search tools associated with them, this approach involves a much more iterative process and collaboration between musicologists and computer scientists. We have a more detailed discussion of our findings so far and our next steps in the unpublished article that we uploaded in case anyone wants to read further, but I'll provide a brief overview here. We began with a study from 1922 by Ludwig Bernarski, who was a student of the very prolific chant scholar Peter Wagner. Today, Bernarski is actually much better known as an editor of the piano works of Chopin, but he did write a book um, on Hildegard's music and published it in 1922. He divides Hildegard's melodies into three modal groups with finals on C, D, or E. Um, he includes her one F final chant, her Kyrie, and the small group of chants ending on G in his C group. So there's a little bit of unusual uh, modal groupings. For each of the three modal groupings, um, he provided hand-drawn tables. Um, and here you can see the first part of the table for the C final grouping. Altogether, across the three tables, he compiled 184 small fragments of melody, which he called motives, um, which ranged from three pitches to over 20. Each motive has an alphabetical label, some with a superscript number, a method still used today in motivic analyses. For the C mode chants, Bernarski identifies 11 main letter labeled motives with numbered variants, as well as combinations of motives including BA um, or DED. He numbers all of the motives uh, within a modal grouping from 1 uh, to X, uh, so we have 1, 2, 3, and so on. And for our purposes, um, to identify them, we are using the letter name of the mode, so in this case C, and the discrete number um, his, uh, that he has labeled the motive with. So we might have uh, C13 or D21 or E5. In terms of our process, uh, Lucia transcribed each of Bernarski's motives into the Volpiano font to create a Bernarski data set. Jake Schindler took the Hildegard melodies that had been transcribed into the Cantus database using the Volpiano font uh, to create a Hildegard melody data set. We searched for Bernarski's motives in the Hildegard data set to see if they came up as recurring motives. We had mixed results but some interesting things. So here you can see um, Bernarski's D17 which appears in four chants and you can see the motive actually appears a couple of times in, in two of the chants. 
We have also searched for n-grams in the Hildegard dataset to find the most frequent rifts. In the 8 grams, these four are the most frequent. The location, you can see there, is the point in the melody in which the riff occurs, and that is an average across all of the um, iterations. So that uh, for the first one, it would appear um, on average 54.67% uh, of the way into the melody. It's interesting that the first and the last of these four most common eight grams um, are actually just transpositions of each other. And at 37 counts, that's pretty significant. Uh, similarly, the second and the third riffs are also related um, through that seven gram, uh, which is a subset of uh, both of them. At this stage, we have no conclusions yet about Hildegard's style. What we need to do is compare the most common n-grams uh, to two large data sets. The first is um, the 6,000 plus melodies from Andrew Hughes's late medieval liturgical offices database, and the second data set uh, comprises the 12,000 plus unique melodies extracted from the 50,000 plus melodies on the Cantus database. We also want to develop inexact matching and do further comparisons of Hildegard's uh, data set with these other two data sets. Ultimately, what we want to do is determine if these riffs are unique to Hildegard's voice or part of a wider compositional trend in the mid to late medieval era. These three approaches together that I've talked about today, the focus on differentiate and mode, searching for shared melodies, and looking for recurring riffs, should give us a clearer picture of Hildegard's activity as a composer and provide a broader context for her output. Thank you.